legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Steve Hughes. Known to the world for two decades as the cutting-edge stand-up comedian who pulls no punches when it comes to the state of current events, Steve was also one of the leading lights of the early heavy metal scene in Australia as part of both Slaughter Lord and Mortal Sin. In 1999, Steve packed up and moved to Ireland to begin his stand-up career. While in Dublin, he took the opportunity to play with Ireland's biggest metal export, Primordial. In the years that followed, Steve has brought his acerbic, irreverent and iconoclastic comedy to stages around the world and released the DVDs while it's still legal, conspiracy realist and nervous breakthrough. Not for the faint-hearted or politically correct, Steve tells it how he sees it in a world gone insane. Hello and welcome Steve and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. No worries, good to be here at last. Yeah, finally. <laughs> Despite the uh, the uh, the little better laid plans that technology had for us, um, I've said a bit about you and your career in my recorded intro. But for people who don't know, just give us a potted bio. Um, you've done a lot over the years, but just to pe- bring people up to speed if if you're a new name to them. Uh, in the sense of everything. Well, if, just, yeah. just just selected highlights. <laughs> well, I started in I started you know like everyone in school and realised well this is no good and then uh. So I made death metal bands, thrash metal bands. So the, so the first ones in Australia in the early eighties. Played in bands for years. Uh, in the nineties, I was I've been in this sort of eclectic rock band, Presto, which then broke up, and I was in this black metal band called Missouri. But I'd started comedy. Being in Australia, it's bad to be an entertainment or an art in any sense. So. Uh, I suddenly realised, you know, am I going to stay in this black metal band in Australia with a bunch of lunatics? Or should I go out to England and do comedy? So I was living with an Irish guy at the time, but I'm still friends with him. He's in the band, actually. He just had to go back to Ireland. He went, well, you should come. And I went, all right. So then I came here, and then I've just been living here for 20 or 15 years doing comedy. Then I went back to Australia to have a little bit of a dark night of the soul for about six years. And now I'm back here in the middle of... Uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call this. <laughs> so it was um, it was in 94, I think, when you first dipped your toe into comedy, and that was before you kind of went at it wholesale. In fact, before you came to Ireland, I think that was in 99. Is that right? Yeah, I started around, yeah, probably around 95. I probably started doing comedy. Then I was doing bands and comedy at the same time, sort of the end of the 90s. And then I uh, just, you know, I just need to be in bands in Australia. A country like Australia is just too isolated there's not enough people there and it's just it's too massive and just it's not interested in art and stuff it's just, my whole life in bands i was focused on getting overseas that was all it was you know because you know if you want to be an artist you just can't be there you know like, unless you want to live there and be an artist but you're not going to really you know it's just <laughs> we, we fuck i could talk about that country for hours <laughs> well one thing whether you it's a lovely place don't get me wrong you know it's like paradise on earth on one on one level on another level, it's just, you know, it's just so isolated and just, it's a strange culture. I don't really suit the culture in Australia, to tell you the truth. It's, 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 it's ah, God. I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, insulting to Australians, but it's just, it's just not deep enough. Well, I've been a few you know, times. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know, just, uh, I, I do know what you yeah, mean, yeah. at least superficially. I had an Australian girlfriend. Uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I spent some time in Australia and people asked me about it, what's it like? And I said, well, 
superficially, sort of visually, and in terms of like you know, kind of food and drink and stuff like that, it's like a an architectural. It's like this mixture of 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 Britain and the U.S. You know, because yeah. you'll see some, you know, and that's the best way to describe it. And at its best, I think the best of both worlds. But certainly, we've got one thing we have in common as a background as as metal musicians. And certainly, when I was there, I was very keen to seek out. You know, we went from didn't get too far, just from uh, Canberra to Sydney to Melbourne. You know, that triangle. And I was seeking yeah, yeah. seeking seeking out anything to do with the metal scene. You know, like record stores. Were there any live shows on? And there was clearly something. You know, happening there was a healthy enough underground, but it was compared to, you know, for the size of these cities, there was, there was like nothing really going on. That's the thing. See, that's what's so interesting. The size of these cities. You're in a city like Sydney, four or five million people, and there's one comedy club. Hmm. But one major one. There's some other ones around, you know what I mean? But there's, but there's sort of pub gigs and stuff, but there's just one club. Well, we were in Melbourne like, for like a, over a, 10 days during that, what, the first trip. And I thought it was nice to take in some live music. And, and the, the only thing we could find on the rock spectrum was a, was a Kiss tribute band in a bar. That was it in the whole of Melbourne over two, t- over 10 days. Mate, it's, it's, that's what I mean. So, I, I mean, we could talk about art in that country for the whole hour. I don't know what you wanted to discuss this hour, but you know, I've thought about that country a lot, not to knock it. In one sense, I can go, okay, I was quite, it's, it's, it's as you said, you've been there, so, you know, growing up there, the sense of it's not some dark satanic mill council house out the back of Glasgow, you know what I mean? But it's like, it's a, it's a, God, I, I really, I could talk about it for hours that country. It's a really interesting place in the sense of it's, it, it seems quite monotonous and boring, but it's, it's depth is quite interesting if, if you look at it. It's a, it's a funny place. It's a dark place, really. Yeah, I find like strange, it's, it's, strange divisions. In the metal scene, I mean, you, normally you you would get these, but I would, in somewhere like even a big city like London, you're know, a bit bigger than than Sydney. I wouldn't even use the word division, but I, I felt that when I was in, well, actually, in, in Melbourne was where I came across it, and I, I found this record store that that stocked metal and, and merchandise, and I think I've got this feeling it was like under a railway bridge or something. It, you know, it was in one of those arches. Anyway, it was an interesting little place. And I was chatting to the staff and I noticed there were some flyers on the counter and there was one, I saw one for Destroyer 666, you know, upcoming show. And I said, oh, I wonder if that's happening while I'm here. And I looked at the flyer and it was like, ah, no, it's not. It's, uh, you know, it's a few weeks away. And this girl, this girl behind the counter said, you realize they're Nazis, don't you? <laughs> and I was kind of like, okay, well, you've got their flyers in your shop, you know, <laughs> maybe don't have those. And then it was really vehement, you know. <laughs> So there was, there was no sense of, um, I didn't feel any sense of like, um, unity. Like everyone seemed to be. No, there's no, well, you know, one, they're not Nazis. I know Keith for 20 years. So, uh, he's just a shit pusher. Like he loves to press your button. So he'll do it. And, uh, but you know, what's funny. I, I, I can look at this, not even just from metal, though, from Australia. Let's just go into this and talk about this for a second. Like, this is, this is the thing about Australia. And, and you get it in Ireland and places like this. I mean, and England and you can do it stuff like you get it right it's just that that tall poppy thing right? but my theories about australia so you see it's very funny or uh, the more successful you get there the less they're interested in you, right so so for example jim jeffries is the biggest stand-up comedian ever to come out of australia australia has no interest in even attaching themselves to it they're embarrassed if he goes there, they give him negative reviews and ban him from the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Just when, when he sells 10,000 tickets in the face of what he does, they still deny him because there's, there's various reasons. These are my perspectives. See, when you don't have a, 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 a long culture, the Australians have always had an, a, an international lack of confidence. Billy Connolly described it once. He goes, you get off the plane there and you haven't even got off the runway and they go, do you like it here? Do you like it here? Do you like it? Because I haven't even been here yet. Right? And it's, and so you get this kind of, well, because you, yeah, you're just isolated. You're out the back. You're like the granny flat out the back of the earth. And you're out there and you're only 200 years old and you just want to do sport and you get a job and you live in a suburb and everything's curtailed in the way that it's, it's, in, 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 it's, it, it's like, it's like a primary school 
the whole you get treated the whole the news talks down to everyone that it's like a big primary school like a big country town like oh we're all australians and that's very un-australian any any idea that goes against the grain is, is branded un-australian but they can't even see how cultish that is right it can shut down an argument straight away well it's very un-australian you could say, well, that's very unfascist, wouldn't you? If you wanted to get into ideology. So and so they kind of see sometimes, I think, giving anybody respect as that the person will become up themselves. So they can't read, so, so they get very competitive, which I always found funny amongst bands and, 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 uh, and artists or comedians in Australia and stuff, where they would get competitive, upset that someone else was getting something better than what they thought they should be getting, as if somehow they're going to get more success than them. But I thought, but you're still in Australia. No one's getting any success. Not real success. You might get a radio show if you think that's success, or you might get something, and you, you, you but but really, success. What you're not you're not going to become Richard Pryor. You're not going to become Billy Connolly on a global, international level. Why? You just what, what? What are you getting upset about with each other? So they get very competitive, and then it gets clicky. And so I was there for like three years in Melbourne, and I did the big comedy club there until they started getting more PC, and then slowly edged me out. But all the other little clubs in three years, no one asked me to do a show. See, they, 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 they've got Steve Hughes there, and I don't want to big myself up, but I've already proved myself through twenty years of international comedy. But I get there and they're like, no, we're not interested in talking to you because they now they feel like, oh, if we show this guy respect, he'll think he's better than us and they don't want to lose their power status. It's also clicky and stupid and, and shoots themselves in the foot because they don't have a massive amount of comedians to use anyway. And then they, someone like me comes back and they, and they don't want to use me. Right now. It's crabs in a bucket syndrome, isn't it? And you mentioned, you <laughs> men, you, you mentioned Ireland and you, to, you totally get that there. I mean, there's, there's probably more people in london central london and greater london than there is in the whole of ireland and you, you've got familiarity with the with the irish scene um yeah and you totally get that there as well just people frantic yeah. that somebody else is gonna uh achieve more success somehow now the the basic instinct for wanting to keep people in check and not get them you know see them disappear too far up their own backside that's basically a good impulse you know it's like oh, keeping everyone honest but it's when that kind of crosses over into like I mentioned crabs in a bucket. You know, the other crabs see one crab trying to crawl out of the bucket, and they will. This is a real thing in 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 real crab life. <laughs> the other crab Mate, will, yeah. will pull the crab back into the bucket. Say, where do you think you're going? Don't get big yeah. ideas. You know, it's a, it's a yeah, it's a, it's just you know. I realise that you know maybe my agents were just because I don't have the agents I used to in Australia that I have anymore. But I was back there, and they were going to do like oh, um, it's kind of a what is it? Just the last Canadian thing or something. We're going to film Australian comedians and then show to the world the best of Australian stand up. Then there's five acts from who, from my agency who were put on that at the time, but I wasn't even asked. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to blow me a trumpet, right? But the only comedians in Australia who've never left Australia, I'm sorry, I'm just more experienced. Than you're not as good at me on a level because you can't be because you haven't done the work, which is why I left Australia because I know that you can't get good without being doing the work. And that's why bands like Pantera came out that were so great and everyone thinks they just, oh, well, they've always been this good. No, they were on the club scene for 10 years doing five gigs a night. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can make the analogy. Yes. So, so, so if you want to be in the Olympics, well, you've got to go to the pool every day if you want to swim in the Olympics, and you've got to swim for four or five hours every day, and that's how you get good. You can't just go for an hour every week because you're not joining the Olympic team because there's blokes who are doing four or five hours every day. So that just it's just simple, isn't it? You do it stuff like that, you get good at it. Yeah, and you've got to you can't you, do it. You don't get good at it. <laughs> and you, you, you've got experience of this phenomenon that you're referring to from a, a musician's point of view and from a stand-up comedian's point of view that is the idea of paying your dues which sounds very old-fashioned and kind of you know almost out of date to some people's ears but you talk about you give pantera as an example you know look it up they, how many was it five albums they did before they you know it got a big deal yeah, five albums and then and plus just that texas you know you're in texas so what in, in the 90s then what they tell me there's like there's like 15 rock clubs Mm. She said to Melbourne, he couldn't find one. They're in Texas now. In the 90s, 15 now. They had to do covers and so forth, American so that kind of stuff. But they got to play, what, four sets a night, <laughs> five nights a week. 
<laughs> you know, like, yeah, you're, 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 you, 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 you know, you're Olympic standard. Yeah, it's like it's like the Beatles talked about um, playing the Cavern Club in Hamburg in their early days, and they would be doing matinees, and and you know, if there was another band didn't turn up, or if there was just a gap in the schedule, just you just go on again, you know, just do yeah, the, do the right. same five six songs again, just keep playing, and you know, you're going to get good even if no one's listening. I mean, it's nothing new, is it? It's simply what you do. If you want to be the good soft team, they go to practice. You want to put on a play, you rehearse. No, it's it's nothing groundbreaking that I've discovered, which is all I just knew in Australia. Well, if I want to get as good at comedy as, say, Richard Pryor, well, I have to do more than one fucking 20-minute spot every two weeks. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not really a comedian there. You're just a guy that does a gig every two weeks. I know, you have to be, I remember when I was in Mortal Sin and we toured overseas, Testament and stuff, and it's the first time we've ever done tours like that, because you just can't do it in Australia, and then we played, what, 30 shows in like 40 days, we'd never done that before, you know, we turned into this machine, you know what I mean? Because yeah, you've, never, you've, never, you've never done that with your band, you've never played 30 nights in a row. <laughs> yeah, and this was, for people who are not aware, who just, this music isn't their thing, this was a band who, um, through an independently released album, managed to achieve international attention um, out of Australia. And, of course, they got they then got licensed by a major label, this, their album did. But that was, like, so unusual for that to happen. I mean, you can't even, you can't even really give an example of, you know, ACDC and even Rose Tattoo are almost not comparable in a way, in, in my opinion. It was a, a different time and different dynamics. It was a were. different thing. It was because I was in Slaughter Lord, Mortal Sin. Slaughter Lord and Mortal Sin were the first two thrash bands, really. Slaughter Lord was more brutal, more, more way ahead of Mortal Sin in the sense of just brutality. Because they were more sort of thrash guys, you know what I mean? Some normal metal tastes like, like Candle Mass and Sabbath and Twisted Sister and stuff like this and slowly getting into Metallica and all that. But Slaughter Lord was all Bathory and Kilt and Frost, Merciful Fate, Exodus and Slayer and <laughs> Creator. And so Mortal Sin were very, it was a strange thing, as you say, what happened. See, Slaughter Lord got known, but only through the underground because I tape traded like hell. So Mortal Sin weren't known in the sort of underground metal scene because the scene was very alive and underground. This was like 85, 86. So, you know, only hell awaits us out and stuff. And so, so, so it was exciting that underground was going. So I knew that if I got into that, Slaughter Lord could get known outside of Australia. And actually, it was the best thing because we wouldn't have got known outside of Australia if we'd only had Kerrang! in that. Once fanzines and that started, I could send those demos to Chile, Sweden, America, Canada, Finland, wherever. You know what I mean? And people took them because the underground was like very, very punk in that thing. But Mortal Sin did that first album and then this happened. So Metallica's getting big. Major labels are sniffing around. And then Bernard Doe gave that first album like 99 out of 100. Uh, the first Mortal Sin album, which just kind of brought those big labels, bang, we'll have that then, because they were looking for another Metallica thing, you know what I mean? You know, when labels suddenly realise, ah, this stuff's going to happen. Huh? Yeah, that's, to so that's totally what it was. In the, in the yeah, with, yeah, yeah, and then sort of, you know, they were good enough on that level. But then, you know, they sort of, you know, Slaughter Lord broke up, Mick from Slaughter Lord joined Mortal Sin, made that second album, improved the band a whole lot, as far as I'm concerned. And then they did that tour. I joined them eventually. They did that tour overseas. But then you see, that's a funny thing. We go overseas, we play with Testament, we play for more, we went to the States and played shows. And then you come back to Australia and you'd get, and no one from the press there would even say anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, like music press, nothing. No, you don't get nothing. A bunch of fucking bozos from the western suburbs of Sydney managed to fucking wangle their way into touring with what was about to become the biggest alternative band in the world at the time, Faith No More. And you get back to Australia and they're just, <laughs> <laughs> right, they're, they're just not interesting. Yeah, it makes you wonder in that sense, uh, you know, what, what, what did they want? You know what I mean? Is, yeah. there, is there nothing that would please them? What, what did they actually want? What did they want to write in favorable terms about anything at all? Oh. I don't know. Oh. You know, it's, I, I spoke to a journalist, to a guy who used to work in, a, in journalism in Australia. He gave me something I'd never thought of. And because Australia used to be a prison, and it was, of course, the people who set up the systems there, of course, were, you know, prison guards and, and judges and whatnot, the elite. And then you've got the scummy pop 
prison population. So basically, the elite are the guards of the culture. And they basically hate Australians because they see them as stuff. You know what I mean? So they're, they're, they're the prison guards of the, of the culture gates that are sort of these, the, the elite ones. That there. There's a great saying uh, it sort of got something to do with this. Just uh, it's, it's not that Australians all come from convicts. It's that a lot of them come from prison guards. <laughs> Right, and so that that kind of elite that 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 stands over the culture itself, and so anything that comes up from the from the culture itself kind is kind of just knocked down, just like it's not let in. Because oh no, because they, because they'd be internationally embarrassed because they know that Australians are fucks, the kind of crass and yobbo like, and so they they they're kind of internationally embarrassed about Australians themselves. So they always try and create a kind of home and away morality to project to the world. Hoping to not, you know, have the world see them as embarrassing. And yet, ironically, when you do project this shallow home and away morality to the world, the world does find Australians embarrassing. And we prefer to see a bit of pathos and honesty and depth to the whole thing. You know what I mean? Which is why films like Wake and Fright were so good. And that's from the seventies, you know, that Australian government freaked out, banned it. The tourism board freaked out, banned it, you know. Kind of what, what Australians are really like. Being told to the world. <laughs> well, for, for me, in terms of if you were looking for it, <clears throat> and these were high profile um, broadcasters and entertainers, for me in the 80s, the best of Australia was Barry Humphreys and Clive James and people that were just, in my opinion, great ambassadors for the country and, and but could, could celebrate the culture and lampoon it at the same time. Oh, yeah. See, there's, you see, that's what's so great about that you notice that lampoon because Australians have a very hard time of being lampooned. All right. So when you're saying, I notice it with my friends, if I, if, I, if I say something negative about Australia, the politics, systems, culture itself, even with my friends, friends I've known for 30 years, especially I was watching a mate of mine one day, they stare at you while you're talking to them as if you're an alien. They can't believe what they're hearing. And then if they don't have an argument for what you've said, they come back with, they just tell you about all the good things. Straight away, yeah, mate, but you know, you've got this and you've got that. And that it's like, it's straight away, it's split second program. Right? Because I think, here's my theories. I think, see, they don't take it as listening to something about the country. They take it personally. Like you're saying something about them. Which is why they end up with, well, if you don't like it here, mate, you can fuck off. No, 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 I'm not saying anything about you, mate. We're looking at what, you know, your, they're almost programmed to defend the very system that's fucking up the arts. Like most countries, really. But, but in a way that's, they take it personally. You see, Andrew Maxwell used to do a great joke, but he goes, you go to Birmingham, you go, you know, I like gigging in Birmingham, you just walk on stage, you go, it's a bit shit here, isn't it? Everyone goes, he's right, you know. See, the English can, you can take the piss out of them. Or the place where they live. If you're funny, you can't just walk on stage and go, what a shithole, you're, you're a bunch of dickheads. They go, well, what are you saying, mate? But if you've got a great joke, they'll laugh. They laugh at the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is a bit shit here. The Australians get very, oh, no, mate, what are you saying about Australia, mate? What are you saying about Australia? Like, well. <laughs> the, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a British comedian whose name escapes me at the moment, and he did an entire tour around the UK based on, and basically he'd, he'd, he'd focus, he'd turn his set primarily on the place that he was in at the time. So it was really about making fun, but, you know, f you know, fondly as well. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't vicious. Yeah. It wasn't vicious, yeah. but, and he would do that. And, you know, I, they were broadcast on Radio 4, BBC Radio 4, and I enjoyed quite a lot of those and people were obviously enjoying. In fact, they almost reveled in it in a little way because wherever it happened to be, you know, like, Stoke on Trent or, you know, uh, Litchfield or some other place, you know, they almost enjoyed being the focus of attention for, for 30 minutes, you know, and that this guy had taken all this trouble to learn about their home. Yeah, man. And to me, you know, that's what these PC people miss. See, that's what comedy is. It's taking the pressure of some of the shit negative bits. By what? By laughing at them. And by laughing at them, they, you, you, you relieve them of some of the power. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a really important quality of, of comedy is actually disarming. And I think yeah, that's... So, so, so suddenly this isn't as frightening. Why? Because we're laughing in the face of fear or tragedy. 
Yeah, and I think that you you're a good example of someone who's making a fine art out of this, really, because so much of of your your um, routines that I've seen, you know, your commentary over the years, you've been doing that. You've been just taking the wind out of the sails of these pompous, you know, assholes <laughs> or, or situations that are, you know, threatening or overwhelming in some way. And, uh, you know, just, just punching holes in these things and, and much to people's relief, I think, in a way. Ah, uh, of course to people's relief. Because I, 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 I put it very simply. I put it, I put it very simply from, from, this I don't know how to sort of quantify, but it's like since I was at school young, I grew up in a very dysfunctional house and rah, 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 and all the stuff that's going to make you. And I was at school and, and, and just, and I just realized early on that, that you're at school and I just realized this is rubbish. Right? They tell us these things and we're just supposed to go, oh yeah, okay. Oh, you, you, you descended from apes. Oh well, yeah, okay. And the universe is so many billion years old. Oh yeah. And we, when the scientists dug up this, and I used to just think, fuck off. I just don't believe you. I just, it's just ridiculous. The world's, the universe is too big to think that you've just got the things and we're all supposed to believe this now. And I just realized that, and then I thought, and now we're at school, I'm learning fuck all. I don't like it here. And then now you want me to finish this and then go to work. Now work, I don't mind, but you, but you want me to get a job, right? And what you want to do, like you've done with school, is steal all my time. Right? So, so very early on, I, I realized this system is bullshit. It's not how people are supposed to live. But people are so programmed by the system, like we all were. So I love it when people get, you think I'm brainwashed, mate? Well, of course you are. Why did you miss out? We all got brainwashed. They put us through the system. School, scientists, priests, right? Cash. That's the brainwashing. That's the paradigm. And I just used to sit there. I can still remember as a kid looking up at the universe and the sky, especially in Australia, it would be so massive, and just thinking, it can't be my destiny to go and get a job in some warehouse and get paid. You think my time is worth $3.80 an hour? Are you out of your mind? This is my life. Why would I give my life to someone for $3.80 an hour? I couldn't fathom. I'm like, this is bullshit. This has got to be bullshit. Of course it's bullshit. Because the universe is organic and natural. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I made up my mind uh, very early on. I'll be in bands or something. I'm not doing this. Sometimes I get paid $200 uh, to, to pounds to be on stage for 20 minutes. And people go, oh, that's a lot of money for 20 minutes. I go, no, it's not. See, you get paid fuck all. My time's worth more than 200. You, you, you want, what, 20 minutes of my life maybe worth in my life? How about I charge you three and a half grand? Yeah, how do you even put a price on that anyway? Yeah, how do you even put a price on it, right? So, 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 it's not that I'm getting paid a lot, right? You're getting paid fuck all by these slave owners in this system. They didn't give up slavery. They just kicked you out of the plantation so you'd have to get your own house. Now we don't even have to give them a fucking shed to live in. We'll make them buy a shed. I'm like, but, but, so I'm just, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And they want five days a week, two days off, five days, two days off. School gets you ready for that. Dings, you're like Pavlovian dogs with bells. Ding. Now you can have lunch. Ding. Ding. It's all programmed. It's all just programming, like a laboratory, you know. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com.